All right, good morning, welcome. My name is Jose Huitron. I'm a lecturer with the Cal Poly uh, San Luis Obispo and the Orfila College of Business. We've also recently ran the uh, student innovation programs, including our hatchery, our summer accelerator, and uh, my heart is in the classroom. So welcome to this session this morning on teaching a storm for student engagement on day one. And basically that comes from a mentor uh, that basically inspired me to really push the limits of what I can accomplish in the classroom. And so I've kind of taken his bottle. It was given to me, and I'm excited to give it to you today on, on teaching a storm. And so let's just kind of set a frame of reference for what we do and what we do in the classroom. We basically, we inspire our students to think about entrepreneurship and, and uh, solutions to the world's challenges and create value in the world, whether it's out of necessity or opportunity. And so what, I, what we all strive to do is to try and create a frame of reference. And so what I'm going to give you today is a little bit of my tools and techniques and, and strategies and things that have been given to me that have really opened up learning pastures and really inspired me to just see how effective they are at getting students to, to wake up in the classroom. And uh, so I'm excited to share these with you. And uh, so, you know, John Dewey said basically that we state emphatically that upon its intellectual side, education consists of the formation of wide awake, careful, thoughtful habits of thinking. On that note, and on that context, I'd like to introduce you to the one-on-one-on-one -on -one -on -one Israel, Isaac, and Nathaniel uh, little sibling rivalry. And uh, let's see if it works here. Oh, it does work, okay. And this is a, uh, an epic battle at Chuck E. Cheese. So I don't know if you caught it. You didn't catch it, but check it out. And so that's what I mean by, by, uh, by wide awake. So, all right, well, we can't do that to our students in the classroom, but basically, how do we create an engaging classroom environment? And, and these are basically principles that we could abide by that, you know, everyone deserves somebody to inspire them in the classroom, right? We, we're here, we wanna be inspired, we wanna be informed today. And so these are just some best practices and some rules of thought. Good teachers make the process and journey of learning enjoyable. And that's what I'm trying to do and, and striving to do in the classroom is to bring entrepreneurship, not just in practice, but educate them on the process of entrepreneurship from idea conception to execution, uh, all the way through the life cycle of a startup and possibilities that we try to facilitate there. Good teachers care about student success, right? We have to show them that we're, we're empathetic, we care, and their, best, their interests are at heart. Another, uh, Another best practice is to treat all students equally, uh, teach students the art of inquiry, and uh, that's what I loved about one of the sessions yesterday was about inquiry-based entrepreneurship, or using an inquiry-based approach in addition to project-based learning. Um, and then, of course, we, we try or should try to utilize a variety of strategies to keep students awake, alive, and engaged in our classroom. And so here's a, a few examples of some of those methods and tools that, that I utilize that have effectively on day one really gotten students to think about entrepreneurship, entrepreneurial thinking, the entrepreneurial mindset, the innovator's DNA. And really the course that I've had an opportunity to teach is Intro to Entrepreneurship. So really we get students from all disciplines, from our six colleges, uh, from different di uh, areas of study, programs, and this is their first taste of entrepreneurship. And so they come in not knowing what to expect, the first thing we try to do is make a connection and open their window and frame of reference to what entrepreneurial thinking can mean for them. And so that starts with an intrinsic look, right? What are their fears, their curiosities, their attitudes, their values? And so one of the techniques that I use is I'll use a tool like Slido, and I'll also do this on a whiteboard, and we'll do an empathy map or we'll do affinity mapping to try and get them to, uh, to un unlock and think about their internal motivations. What are they curious about? What are, what are they fearful of? Well, like any entrepreneur, we have, so here's my pivot. So, so basically what I do with Slido is uh, we'll put an open, an open word map, a, uh, a word map there, a word cloud, and I'll let them respond real time. And they'll respond to my chat, I'll give them a prompt, they'll scan the code, and then what will happen is it'll create a lively discussion where they can see all the different answers. What are you fearful of? What are you curious about? I'm curious about how to raise funds, how to talk to investors, how to pitch my idea, how to build a product from the ground up. And then when it comes to fears, you know, I like to, I like to get them to anonymously, no pressure, think about what are, you, what are you fearful of? Let's talk about your career, the future. And so number one across the board, and I've, I've taught this and used this approach for several quarters, several years, and, and basically number one is failure, is the fear of failure. And so the way I connect it to, hey, I too can be an entrepreneur, or I too can 
look internally or look externally and make a connection to my degree, my passion points, and what I'm connected to, to say, you know what, hey, I'm just like these other students um, that have come before me. So I'll show them the word cloud and the results from several quarters before the, the live quarter uh, word cloud uh, invitation that I take. And they'll see, yeah, failure, not being able to bounce, bounce back from failure, things like climate change, not being able to make money, being on the wrong career path. And I'll show them numerous examples where, hey, there's a lot of commonality um, both on fears and curiosities. So another key approach, another key thing I love to do, and it's kind of cool right now because Super Mario is you know, a pretty big deal with just doing 377 million, uh, one of the biggest animated releases. And of course, if you've played the game over time, you know about Super Mario. But what I like to do is I like to make the connection to entrepreneurship being a power up. Hey, did you know that there is a power up? There is a, a level up in your career that you could facilitate and uh, let's just talk about it. Let's talk about skills. And that's in the form of entrepreneurial thinking. So I break it back to their internal motivations, their fears and curiosities. And then I also tie it back to the importance of skills, and particularly future skills. What is the world looking for? Where is the battleground for skills? What are the skills of the future? And so what I emphasize is in the upper quadrant here, the battleground for skills is in areas like problem solving, leadership, adaptability, creativity, and collaboration. And oh, by the way, this is the DNA of, an, of having an entrepreneurial mindset. This is what we do as entrepreneurs. And so I set the stage for the relevance of skill building, which tends to help them recognize, you know what, maybe I should take advantage of this class um, and this pathway uh, for entrepreneurship. And then I show them, hey, how hard is it to find these skills? Skills like creativity and innovation, number one, hardest skill to find, according to the survey results from leaders and executives, number one, problem solving. How do I find people with problem solving ability? So that's hardest to find. Creativity and innovation comes in at number five. And so I'll show them numerous graphs and numerous opportunities to say, hey, this is what the world is looking for in terms of my resume and how I should build my resume. And so I'm like, oh, by the way, when you're interviewing, you should maybe add these, you know, emphasize these skill sets and use the STAR method and use, you know, show them where and how you've developed these skills. And so at the top, when you look at other surveys, this is from the World Economic Forum. Top skills for 2025 is analytical thinking and innovation, active learning and learning strategies, and complex problem solving. And what I like to emphasize, especially when we're in the classroom, this very project-based, it's very activities and, and uh, getting them to think critically, is to really embrace the idea of learning and unlearning, right? To, it's important to learn and unlearn. And so here's a, a few of my exercises that I like to do. I like to do an exercise, I can't do it today for sake of time, but I like to do an exercise called half-baked. And this was given to me from being a part of different hackathons and launch pad events. And basically, it's called half-baked. And so I would pull the room and I'd say, you know what, what are you thinking about? What are you thinking about in the world? Uh, where are the opportunities? And, and I'll sometimes tailor it. I did it in a food science and nutrition uh, workshop where we were speaking to some students in food science and nutrition. And uh, we got them to say, hey, throw some words on the wall. So they were throwing things like food quality and taste taste quality and all these food science and nutrition very specific to their discipline words and they throw them up on the wall. We do a whiteboarding session and uh, the way I do it in my classes is we'll, we'll kind of give me some random words. So they'll give me words like climate change, sustainability, marshmallow, lotion, moon, boot, shark, and we'll just keep these words coming. And then what we do is we'll say, oh, by the way, we're gonna create a new startup or come up with a new idea or try to solve a problem using three of the words that we just brainstormed. So it is kind of like an idea storm. It's like a chat storm to get students to think about possibilities on the fly, but it's a good exercise because it's impromptu. It's impromptu, it's on the fly, and it's kind of a preview of where we're gonna go or where we typically go uh, in Business 310, which is our Intro to Entrepreneurship class. So the results are really fun. It's engaging, it's pretty high stakes. Uh, what I do to make sure that the teams are incentivized is I do an epic battle of rock, paper, scissors, and, you'll, and that's a freebie, you can have that. Do an epic battle of rock, paper, scissors, and you have the losers follow the winner until you get to the final, the final two champions, an epic battle of rock, paper, scissors, and the winners get to pick the words from this exercise called half-baked. And so I can tell you, when you're in a room and you're running rock, paper, scissors, that you'll start to, you put music behind it, and uh, it, be, it, it awakens the classroom. And you know, so as entrepreneurs, we have a clear Mount Everest. We have a clear path. Uh, and so what's important, one of the elements that um, is important to bring into the classroom is this, um, you know, Sarvathi's three questions. So Sarvathi's three questions is, is about looking internally. Who am I? What do I know? 
and who do I know? So it's a, a theory around effectuation, driving more effective idea generation. And it's called effectuation. And so what I like to do is I like to term it founder efficacy or launch efficacy. How do you get students to launch effectively and to think about startups and building the entrepreneurship mindset? And so using the three circles and Sarvathi's three questions, we get them to look internally. And um, the way I do that is, is starting with, well, who am I? What do I know? Who do I know? And let's blend those three together. And then what I'll also do is I'll bring prompts into the classroom to get them to think about what's happening in the world. And you'll see that from some of the slides that we, we reload here is, is these, this idea of what's happening in the world. That's why I love the UN, the SDGs, because that's super relevant. That works. It gets them to, to dig deeper beyond you know, typical ideas that you'll see generated or how, how far students will reach with entrepreneurship. And so when they're thinking about SDGs, or they're looking at the World Economic Forum and saying, what are the top challenges for the world and things like climate change, sustainability, supply chain and logistics issues, I'll, so, I'll show them a picture of things like the evergreen stuck in the Suez Canal. I'm like, this affects us, and here's how it affects us. Or I'll show them the, um, the recent stockpile of all the container ships in the Long Beach area that are waiting to bring all of our products and supplies to us. Another thing I'll do, I'll do recently is I showed them because of the, the uh, atmospheric rivers, the storms that we've had in California, I'll show them, and in Santa Barbara County, in San Luis Obispo County, it was quite, quite effective. Uh, it had a real impact, and it shut down the freeway. And I'll show them pictures of, hey, this is what's happening in the world. This is how close to home it hits. What ideas can you come up with that, might, that we might be able to dig and explore um, in the course of this quarter and over the course of Intro to Entrepreneurship. So let's see if I can load up my slides here and I'll give you some prompts to, to leave you with. All right, so we talk about superpowers, the uh, entrepreneurship, the entrepreneurial mindset as the ultimate power up and tying it back to skills, using activities like half-baked. Um, I also like to incorporate, really this is a relatively new area for me, but it relates to Sarvathi and to a lot what our previous speaker was talking about, which is Theory U. I don't know if we're, we're familiar with Theory U and uh, developed out of MIT, a professor and colleagues at MIT, but I like what, it's, what, what it focuses on. It focuses on this idea of presencing. How do you pull from the past and tie to the future what your interests might be and what you might be built to work on? And so it really, it really ties those intrinsic internal connection points to what the world needs and what a student has the opportunity to work on. Another thing I like to do is I like to tie back, you know, the origins of startup stories. Like I'll show them, I'll show them uh, macaroons or a picture of a bakery, and I'll say, did you know by being, by being empathetic, by connecting on the street, connecting to business owners, by keeping your opportunity radar on, you can go and have conversations and realize, uh, like the founding team from DoorDash, you can realize that if somebody's sitting on a receipts for delivery orders that they can't fulfill. Did you know you can turn macaroons or a bakery into a $2 billion, $4 billion startup that you know, is in the case of DoorDash? And so it gets them to see, hey, ideas start, it can come from anywhere. Nobody has a monopoly on good ideas. Another thing I like to do with, in terms of techniques is what's called uh, the business model canvas throwdown. So are we all familiar with the business model canvas? So the BMC throwdown, and this particular exercise, when you talk about engaging, Thinking, thinking how to awaken the classroom, how to not just go through the BMC and start with the, you know, the right side of the canvas and talk about customer segments and value props and channels, but it awakens the students to kind of think immersively about this essential tool that we use in entrepreneurship and uh, idea building. And so I do the, the, business model, the business model canvas breakdown. I'll put a picture of you know, something like Instagram versus Be Real. And they're like, hey, how is the, the business model for Instagram different from Be Real? Well, Be Real is more from my close-knit network. It's more my authentic connections. And we have to share content at a certain time. So in terms of social media platforms, there are some intricacies and some differences there. I'll say, let's look at Costco, the warehouse, right? Let's look at Costco. What's the business model for something like Costco versus Target versus Walmart? And uh, if you're an entrepreneur who comes up with an idea and you want to get into Costco or Trader Joe's, they're going to want to put their name on it. And they're going to want a piece of the pie, right? In terms of white labeling and licensing. So that kind of introduces um, the different elements of the BMC and gets them to think uh, a little bit more deeply about how, what they're already familiar with. And that's probably one of the takeaways from today's session is help students pull from the familiar. How can they pull from the familiar to create the future that they have an opportunity to create? Um, 
that's a, a really a really effective exercise. Another thing I like to do is really incorporate the elements of Dan Pink's uh, book, A Whole New World, uh, A Whole New Mind. That book is given to me by a mentor, and it's A Whole New Mind by Dan Pink, the, the speaker, the thought leader. And he, he identifies six components, six components that really, you know, that, that lead impact, that organizations, if utilized correctly, can facilitate good success. And the first one is design. And I'm not going to go through all of them, but there's empathy, meaning, symphony, uh, and there's one that really stands out to me, which is the idea of play. And I think that's really important when we're in a session to kind of build people up. And that's why I like to do rock, paper, scissors battles or get people thinking about, you know, this idea of solutions and possibilities is, um, you know, let's play. Let's have fun. Let's make entrepreneurship fun. And if you notice the first word, the first word of my session today was edify. And that's what I mean by looking internally at things like Sarvathi's three methods is Edify means to help build the founder, help build the student, help build the learner before, you go, before they go out and build their ideas. That's why I start with their frame of reference. And then the gamut, it's much easier to get them to think about creating the future and creating uh, entrepreneurship. So one of the, just showing you, those are the pictures from you know, making things relevant. So one of the things I like to do is an exercise called the VC lab. And I actually am hoping to maybe turn this into a course of some sorts because it works. You get them to think about Shark Tank. You show them an example of a startup pitch. I like to show them Outlet. Outlet is like the ultimate example. This team has been around for several years. And when you watch their pitch, they do like a textbook pitch through the BMC. And so I ask them, hey, after I show them the pitch, I say, would you invest? And I can't tell you how much discussion it leads into because I do think pair share. I have them to think about it individually. They pair up and then they share. And then the next thing you know, they're, they're, we're having a lively discussion around would you would you invest? And I'll show them live pitch days from, from tech stars, from 500 startups. And one of the platforms I use is Stonks. I love their platform because they have live pitches and they have the pitch decks. And I ask the students, would you invest? And I can tell you, in terms of engagement, that is a, a ultimate lift for, for courses because it makes it relevant. I think that's a key to, to edification in the classroom is relevant material. Um, and so that gets us through things like Bloom's technology. Uh, Bloom's taxonomies. Um, so how do we learn from the future as it emerges? How do we learn from the future as it emerges? Well, we got to dig into who we are and our past. And so, um, let me see here. So let me see. I'll leave, you, I'll, leave you, I'll leave you with this here. The other thing I like to do is I like to use interactive tools, not just whiteboards and break it up and do it kinesthetically in the classroom, but I also enjoy using uh, things like Miro. And I don't have time to show you our mirror boards, which basically capture a student's idea generation process from initial concept through experimentation and MVP design um, is the idea of using or doing an empathy map and bringing an exercise into a platform like Miro. The students, the students are wide-eyed. They are just awakened into just tremendous possibilities. They've never, they've never seen, like if you've ever seen Miro or, or a virtual collaboration tool and you have 30 to 35 people coming in at the same time, it's a class, it, it awakens the classroom and it opens their eyes and it's a future skill. Virtual collaboration is a future skill. So I really like to emphasize tools like Miro, Slido, and uh, the whole gamut. So uh, appreciate your engagement, your, <laughs> your uh, patience during this session. I think I'm out of time, right? Okay, well, thank you. Do we have any questions for our first speaker here? All right, here we go. Ah, very interesting. I was wondering in this notion about idea generation, one of the earlier things you talked about, this concept development, the word mapping, how does something like GPT fit into this now? Because it seems like that's something, and I don't know if that's something that is going to facilitate this kind of creative thinking or hinder it. So if you can maybe talk a little bit about that, that'd be great. They're going to find a way to use ChatGPT in the classroom, and they have, which I've actually embraced. And, and I have a really good example from last quarter. And this quarter, they're using it for, you know, they're, they're, uh, I'll give you last quarter's example. So one of the ideas, well, hey, I'm a, do -it -year, I'm a DIY home gardener, and I, um, I know there's a lot of home, home uh, DIYers trying to make sense of landscaping and gardening, maybe a little bit new to that or don't have all the information and resources they need. So they put together a startup called Secrets of Zen. And so we had been joking and talking about ChatGPT and said, hey, I don't want you, you know, here's how, here's what's happening, um, and let's, let's talk about AI a little bit. And so they actually went the extra mile to incorporate a ChatGPT into that MVP landing page, and they called it Ask Zen. And they put it in there, and it said, Ask Zen. 
So I use, okay, well, I ask Zen, I put it in there, I put my prompt in there, I said, how do I keep my aloe vera from dying? You know, and so it gave me an answer. Um, this quarter, they're using it right out the gate. Um, they're using it for things like the name of their startup, an early name, and they're getting names like, hey, if you're trying to get in and out of the gym, Swift Lift. It's so chat GPT, thank you, Swift Lift. Um, another example with, with uh, chat GPT and AI, I use it, so I used it because I give, you know, like giving talks and presentations, I used it recently. I said, hey, what should I tell a room of economic development leaders about, um, about the BMC? You know, I'm gonna teach a room of decision makers and leadership San Luis Obispo about the business model canvas. And it, and it gave me textbook answers. ChatGPT gave me textbook answers around how to make it relevant for them. So students are gonna embrace it. They're having fun with it. It's actually a great connection point between, hey, here's how you could use ChatGPT. I have many questions, but uh, <laughs> let's start with one. So I really enjoyed the, your presentation and it was fantastic examples, but this is not only for you, but maybe for everybody. Like, you are the prototype of an entrepreneurship professor, engaged, motivated, fun, interesting, right? Now. At the university where I work, Tech de Montreux, we have 28 campuses with uh, thousands of students in entrepreneurship and hundreds of entrepreneurship professors, about 140 is the full faculty. It's very difficult to replicate yeah. th this, this engagement. What would you suggest, and maybe for everybody, like what would be the strategies of, because you, not e like every professor has a different teaching style maybe, and not each, like, the, like this energy that you have maybe is difficult to replicate. So I don't know if you have any ideas of how to create this engagement in classroom within different teaching styles of the different professors, but still trying to engage prof uh, students in the entrepreneurship classroom? That's a, that's a good question. I think what, what we strive to do is we, we strive to do peer share. We, we share a lot of our best practices and tools, and I'll learn from Dr. Robinson, I'll learn from Dr. Metcalf, and we, we really try to drive peer collaboration, and we have a very close-knit community with our, fa with our faculty and peers within entrepreneurship at Orphala College of Business. And we don't have you know, that, th those, that many locations, of course, but, but I think it's modeling the way for your peers and giving them techniques, one, one piece at a time that they can embrace using their style. And I'm learning that I, I may do it differently, but in many cases, their approach is gonna get them to the same destination. So I think the uniformity comes from collaboration and, and, uh, and uh, you know, having an aligned an aligned commitment to, in this case, student engagement in the classroom. Um, not everybody's gonna be, you know, ex you know lively and, and the whole gamut, but I think, I'll tell you what a student told me when I was doing my own customer development in the classroom, and they basically said, how can we make this better as we expand curriculum and do, do um, some improvements here? And they said, well, you know, it's important, why don't you let us build the house and let us chart our own path? So in many ways, the students, if the professor allows the students to chart their own path, then you're gonna, you're gonna probably have a more conducive classroom to you know, more engaged and, and uh, lively classroom. Great, yeah, thank you for asking that. It, it would be a challenge, yeah. Hey, how are you? The work that me and Debbie Kleinman did, um, Debbie used to run the Entrepreneurship Center at Babson, was in response to um, what we saw in student engagement post um, COVID. And so, what we were worried about was um, students being um, being changed by their experience. Do we need to change programs? Methodology was we interviewed um, students, staff, and then uh, faculty, um, sorry, staff and faculty from multiple universities across the country. So for those of you who participated in that, thank you very much. Um, what did we find? So, we found generally across the board a decrease in 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 person student engagement in programs um, that continuing problem that we all have getting um, um, the marketing programs the marketing message right as we as we send as we, in a very busy environment um, that we have uh, in our schools um, this this idea that we can get is interdisciplinary participation, which is very powerful and one that we all want to achieve, is uh, difficult to accomplish. And that we were seeing um, lots of staff and faculty turnover and burnout. And we found that this was all of these themes were echoed um, from other entrepreneurship centers. So um, students themselves um, were struggling. Um, 
um, post COVID, um, and I'm sure all of you in the room um, can empathize with this slide. Um, and and obviously the a, a sense of uncertainty um, and stress following um, following the pandemic. Uh, here is a quote from uh, a BU student. Um, and um, I think that this again was echoed by other interviews with students. Again, we didn't just interview BU students, we interviewed students from um, other universities and, and colleges. Um, just one interesting um, fact that that resonated was that uh, was that we were seeing censors were seeing an increased participation of um, female students. Um, in fact, I just got some data this week from NBU to show that we have as many teams led by female entrepreneurs as male entrepreneurs. So that that trend continues to uh, continue. Um, but that black founders continue to be unrepresented and um, lack um, mentors that they can feel um, can understand them and inspire them. So some of the one of our first things that we did um, was to cut the cord. Um, we uh, ended hybrid and online meetings um, apart from one on one mentor meetings. Um, I think that's actually been a tremendous bonus that we can have mentors from all around the country or from all around the world. But as far as events were concerned, we made up our, our events in person. Um, and we wanted to, to demonstrate the value of that. Sometimes we provide a live stream link for important events, but only make that link available at the last minute. And we'll probably discontinue that as well. Um, the idea here is that um, you know we we want to create accidental collisions. We think the power of some of our programs is the fact that people can meet each other and end up working together on projects, and that doesn't happen online. So some other best practices. Um, um, we, we're we're trying to get better at this. Um, and I think all of us are trying to get better at this. Is is demonstrating to the students that that um, work coming to the entrepreneurship center is not just about becoming an entrepreneur and having your own job after college. It might be that, um, but it also it also probably more importantly um, is creating a skill set that employers will be interested in and um, employers will talk to you about during your interview and be impressed that you you that you made something happen during your time in college. And we have plenty of anecdotal evidence that this is uh, that this is happening. But this but again, um, this message is difficult to get across and is nuanced. So um, this is definitely work in progress, uh, at least as far as uh, as our center is concerned. Um, this is something we've we've really taken on board since the report. Uh, get more students involved in terms of ownership of the um, experience. Um, let them organize events, let them moderate events. Um, and we, we're trying to do much more of this. Um, developing transitions and traditions, um, creating milestones, community wins, we're, we're doing that. Um, just to give an example of that, we. We now have a special event for the Innovation Entrepreneurship Minor graduation where we've created our own little event and we give people a cord they can wear at graduation. Um, so we, and for some of our signature event, the Innovation Pathway, we, as people advance on the pathway, we have little ceremonies to, to, um, to celebrate their advancement on the, on the pathway. So, this was um, research that, that Deb actually did from um, an interview with Brent Turner, who runs a um, an event and uh, and meeting uh, agency. We felt that it was important to, to maybe go out to some experts and and get some get some opinions and input from them. Um, and this was some of the points that Will, uh, sorry, Brent made in his interview with. Um, with Deb, and we we definitely try to um, take these 
um, points um, on board. Something that I that 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 I'm very keen on with our centre staff is that we have to be that our our programmes and our experiences have to be different from class. It, you can't expect a student to be in class all day and then come and sit down and listen to th you know to three panelists, however expert they are, talk at them for an hour. That's really really replicating what they've done all day. You know, the entrepreneurship centers activities should be um, should be more fun, they should be more engaging, they should be more collaborative. And so we've really tried to do this and, and any panels that we do have, we kind of organize them a little differently and, and have them as much more collaborative um, events. So wanted to go through this fairly quickly, so maybe we can do some questions, but um, welcoming words and deeds. So um, I think all of us feel like we do that, but when we looked at how we actually greet people in the center, we realized we could make some improvements. Um, really worked with student leader, leaders to, to help them lead the, uh, some of the programs and, and embrace the mission, uh, the entrepreneurship mindset message, um, created events that drive interactions, um, um, working on amplification through the student body, um, cross campus challenge, uh, champions, faculty, staff, um, and of course, the strength of your marketing um, really matters. So the report was a lot longer than that, um, um, but I wanted just to give you some highlights for, um, for this short presentation. Um, and you can get a full copy of the report at the uh, bit.ly link here, or you can uh, scan the um, QR code. Um, so again, apologies for not being there. It wasn't for want of trying. And if any of you want to um, come and talk to me tomorrow, I'd be, uh, be very happy. And, and maybe there's some time for questions here. All right, thank you so much. Um, Definitely very interesting study over here. Do we have any questions based on his report? Ian, thank you very much for, for your presentation. I have one very short question. Uh, you were mentioning this overwhelm of the students coming back from the pandemic. And indeed, we also noticed a lot of increase in the like mental health troubles of our entrepreneurship students. Uh, it almost tripled after the pandemic. Is there any suggestions or ideas that you might have from your report uh, to give, like, provide coaching, maybe, or or this support systems for for the mental well-being of our entrepreneurship students? Yeah, that's a great great question. And obviously, we're not mental health professionals, so we have to be a little careful. Um, from our perspective, what we did was was try and create more um, low-key events where people could. Um, participate. I mean, if we think that one of the underlying problems might be loneliness or might be sat in the dorm room not knowing how to participate in events, we tried to create more kind of low-key events where people could could come to without um, feeling a lot of pressure. So that was our kind of participation in that. And then, um, but um, obviously, we we have to be careful in terms of. Um, of, uh, of, of not setting ourselves up as mental health professions, which we already have on campus, as, as you probably do. Quick question. You did mention about cutting the cord. I really was really interested in this because our university did that as well. As soon as yeah. we could, we came back face to face. What evidence do you have that uh, tells you that was a good decision? Oh, yeah. Good. Great. Great question. I mean, I think... I don't know whether, you know, evidence is a big word, um, but let's just take it apart, just break it apart a bit. I mean, I think that um, staff and faculty are much happier doing in-person events. So I think that's important. I talked about the fact that, you know, we're having staff and faculty burn out, and I think part of it is too much time on Zoom. So actually them engaging with students in real time, in person was very important from from the morale of the group um, um, but also um, you know talking to students and um, and the participation rates I guess this is one piece of evidence the participation rates for in-person events were higher 
than um, for virtual events. And again, a little bit anecdotal, but we saw um, students after in-person events um, go off and work with each other on a few occasions. So that was kind of promising. But I take your point, you know, what is what is the evidence? But, I mean, you're probably doing the same thing. We may not have evidence, but it feels a whole lot better, doesn't it? Any other questions from the audience? Well, I have one for you if nobody else have any other questions. Um, I'm kind of curious, what's your take on the balance of in-person versus, you know, some of the online lectures? Because after COVID, uh, I do get a sense from my students that, you know, they're they are demanding more online material, especially now they're used to, you know, being able to take some of the lectures and watch some of the videos from the comfort of their own beds. Uh, and they started to think, you know, especially the lecture part of some of the uh, things of what we do is probably better suited for some of the online format. And then, you know, uh, although we do talk about the mental health issues and how, you know, just, you know, having them on Zoom all the time is causing issues of loneliness, but I feel like it's a paradoxical situation. They want to stay at home, but also I feel like we also need to push them to get out of the bedroom and then be engaged and then do these in-person activities. I just wonder how do you balance this in-person and uh, online teaching formats? Yeah, no, I think, you know, I think that's obviously what all universities and colleges think about. But I go back to, you know, what is the, what are we trying to accomplish in entrepreneurship centers? And, uh, you know, and, and I think one of the, one of our main philosophies is we, is we create opportunities that create collisions. And, you know, you just don't create collisions on Zoom. Um, and so these accidental collisions. So, we, um, you know, if we go back to basic philosophy, we really feel like we have to get people, um, you know, in a room and get them talking and get them doing activities together that that, that creates that. So for, for us, it's almost a philosophical kind of kind of kind of mantra that that that's very um, important to us. Now, what happens in the curriculum in terms of um, of online or, or a mixture of online and and um, and in person, you know, is way above way above my pay grade at BU. And obviously, those discussions are going on. We're very much an in person university, but I think the stuff we are involved in the entrepreneurship center. I think that you know, um, almost exclusively now we're online. Apart from as I mentioned, you know. I think the opportunity, I think one-on-one -on -one mentoring can be just as effective on Zoom as it can be, uh, or almost as effective as it can be in person. So we are doing some of that, and and that's allowing more flexibility in our choice of mentors um, because they're a little less, it's more time efficient for them, but also it's geographically um, convenient for them as well. So. Hi, um, I just had a suggestion because this issue that she just brought up is like near and dear to my heart. Um, I also have like similar mental health issues where I struggle to go to places in person, but at the same time, um, being in person helps, you know, these mental health issues. Um, but I'm wondering, you know, there are people who struggle to get into the classroom, who struggle to go to these places. And so by not having the option to have these workshops online, you are reducing the accessibility for students who, you know, can't get in for whatever reasons. Um, so mm -hmm. I, I'm thinking like, obviously Zoom needs to be improved in some way. Like, I, I don't think it makes sense for us to kind of take a step back and say, okay, we're not gonna go online at all. I think we need to continue to move forward, especially in um, thinking about entrepreneurship. And I wonder if you guys, this is a long way of me asking, if you guys have thought about um, like AI and VR technology and utilizing that as a way to um, allow students to engage from their own space, but still, you know, have collisions, mm -hmm. like you said. Yeah, no, I, I, I mean, I think every entrepreneurship center is going to make its own, make its own choices on that. And, and your point on technology is an interesting one. Does that, does that change things? But um, I, I, I tell you a point, we're, we're, we're tackling it a different way, which is, which is rather than, I, I accept that there's some students who, who, who don't want to come, but 
other ways, instead of saying the answer is we'll make it available by Zoom, is the answer, why is our space intimidating students? What can we do to make it less intimidating? How can we engage um, those students and make it easier for them to come? We're focusing kind of our time and effort on that. Um, now, I do not hesitate to say that it's hard, but that's where we're focusing our time rather than maybe without being controversial here, maybe not jump into the easy solution of making it uh, virtual. And I would say just to the point earlier, um, we're actually our, our attendance is higher for um, in-person events than it is for virtual events. All right, I think we are running out of time here. Uh, thank you both to our speakers and thank you for being here. I'm glad we were able to make this work even though one of the speakers is actually still in Chicago. Uh, thanks again, everyone. And uh, if you have more questions, please feel free to reach out to our speakers here. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll see you tomorrow, everybody.